Hey guys, welcome back for another video. Today, we're gonna to be setting up a dedicated Plex server and NAS all-in-one with the new Synology DS1019 Plus. This is their latest five-bay solution. What this will give us is a dedicated standalone box to serve all of the movies to the home theater. Now, they are highly expandable, very lightweight. I've been doing attached storage for, I don't know, 15 years. I've been doing this since before there was such a thing as a network attached storage. As a photographer, I had been using Drobos for many years, both for holding archived photos and for backups. But they have the unfortunate situation of being very slow. So while back in the day I was serving ripped DVDs, no problem over Drobos, that's about their limit. Once you get into Blu-rays, you can really kind of forget about it. And UHDs, not even close. So you have to go to something more dedicated. Now I've been running everything for the last few years because I got rid of my Drobos years ago when I stopped shooting weddings and didn't need ungodly amounts of storage. I've been running off a large RAID array inside my desktop, which means the computer has to be on running the drives and running the Plex server anytime I want to watch a movie. Not so anymore with this. This literally just sits in the house anywhere plugged into an ethernet port. And I got this particular unit for multiple reasons. One of which is it's silent so it can go in my office right next to my switch and next to my other gear and it's not going to bother me while I'm working. We have two pretty much silent fans. This thing tested at 30 dB under load, which you can't hear. My, my noise floor in the house is 50. So this will be truly silent. You have dual ethernet ports. You got a power port, a USB three port and an expansion port. The other cool thing about the Synology units is you have available expansion modules. So you don't have to swap out all your drives. If you, when and if you run out of space, you can just buy an expansion module, which doubles the amount of bays and it's cheaper than buying another whole unit because you don't need the processor and all the ancillaries you learn, you're literally just buying five more bays. You pop the drives in and the one controller in here does it all. Or of course you can upgrade any particular drive at any given time. Depends on which RAID type you go with. This does support them all. I'm going with the native Synology topology, which gives you error correction, hot swappable in any bays at any time. And it's a very good performance. So we're just going with that. We've got a power switch on the front and everything else is configured once you get it set up through a web interface. So drives, you can put pretty much anything you want in a NAS. I do highly recommend that you go with a special NAS drive though. And there are several different models out there. The two large brands are going to be Western Digital with their Red Series and Seagate with their Iron Wolf Series. I went in this case with the Iron Wolfs particularly because the Synology units work specially with the Iron Wolf to give you enhanced data correction on the fly. And they don't do that with the Western Digital Reds. They're the same price, same performance. So there's really not a huge reason I see to go with one over the other as far as raw drive performance or capability. So I chose the four terabyte units specifically because they run at a lower RPM than the six and above, which are 7,200. These are 5,900 again, mainly for noise and putting five of these in here once formatted will give me 16 terabytes of dedicated movie storage, which is about three times what I'm going to be copying over to it. So it leaves me plenty of room in the future for expansion. But again, if you need to expand, you simply pop out one drive at a time and it will rebuild that volume and you can expand that way or you can add a module, but this will serve me for at least a few years, which is about when I like swapping out drives anyway. So not a big deal. These were only 99 bucks a piece. I'll tell you, storage is super, super cheap. When I started out with Drobos, four terabyte drives were the cutting edge and I was paying 600 bucks a piece for them. That should tell you how long it's been. <laughs> now these are almost the smallest you can buy, but very good for multi-bay NAS 
applications. And if you're wondering what the difference between a NAS hard drive and a regular hard drive is, there are now in the market several classifications of drives. And there didn't used to be. This is a fairly recent thing. Back in the day, you just had a hard drive. And you, you simply bought by the capacity. And if it was on sale, and if it was a reliable brand, or increasingly now a reliable model. So a NAS drive has a lot of physical protections built in, made for applications where you have multiple drives installed. If you just have a single hard drive, say in a computer, in a desktop, it spins and it works, it, that's it. I mean, you have a platter, it's basically like a record player, you have multiple records stacked on here and multiple needles. And it spins and it seeks and it pulls your data, that's it. When you put two together, you now have two spinning, two vibrating at slightly different rates and that can cause problems over time with those needles and with the platters and with data correction and errors and everything creeping up. And then as you expand more and more and more, that's just more vibration, especially if it's running like a security cam recorder or a NAS where they're pretty much operating 24 seven. So the NAS drives give you a lot of extra vibration dampening and a lot of special correction in the software, in the firmware, in the drive itself to help correct anything that's gonna come down the pike due to multiple drives in the system. So that's why you want a NAS drive if you're actually building a NAS. So in the box, there's not too much to go over. You've got a couple ethernet cables. You've got a power cable, which goes to a laptop, laptop brick, and that ends in a DIN cable to go in the back. We're just going to physically insert our drives. They go in these special trays and they are lockable. They do give you a key. We plug it in. We go to the special web address to set it up, choose our RAID format, and we're in business so we can start copying movies over. You just put the drive in, press in these side panels that go into where the screw holes are. Slide one in at a time. Okay, let's plug it in, set it up. And there we go, got it wired into the network. It just took a minute to initialize, and now it's waiting for me to log in. We'll set our RAID, format it, and start copying. Once here, we're just gonna go to setup, and we're gonna update it. it says it's gonna take about 10 minutes. Now another really cool feature about this particular unit is it not only has the five drive bays, it has two NVMe slots on the bottom. So you can install two ultra fast SSDs if you're concerned about actually using this for real time file management, that absolutely makes things fly. I'm just doing movie streaming so I don't need those, but it makes it a very versatile unit. Update is done. Now it's in the middle of restarting. I don't know if it's going to actually take that long because there's nothing on it yet. And I just want to confirm that it is from more than one foot back, 100% silent. Can't hear a thing. If I get right up next to it, you just hear a tiny bit of air movement. That's it. So it ended here with about five minutes on the countdown. Now I can go ahead and set up my access to it. Now here's a cool feature. If you need to access files on it from outside your network, you can do so here using a Synology account. I don't need to, so I'm skipping this. Now the interface here is running on Linux, very minimalistic, but should be very familiar to any Windows or Mac person. Now we're gonna go through a little tour here. Package Center is your app store, your Google store. This is where you install third-party stuff. Yes, it is a full computer, it's Intel-based, it's got RAM, it's running a full version of Linux. It just happens to have five drive bays. And we can install stuff to it, including Plex server. And that's what we're gonna do. Control panel, very much like any computer. 
It's going to be constantly monitoring the health of the drives and the files and help take care of any particular problems. It'll monitor its internal usage here. CPU usage is going to be almost nothing for me. If I was transcoding, this would be fluctuating quite a bit. RAM is probably going to go up as it creates a buffer for streaming the UHD movies especially. And then we have the uh, LAN usage up and down, just like any resource monitor you're used to. Here in control panel is where we set all of our settings, including any files or folders that you want shared, any users you want to add to it, just like Mac or Windows, basically, and anything you want about the display and stuff like that. Nothing really critical. I don't need to do anything. I'm the only user that's going to be logging into it, basically from my other devices. I'm not going to be using external access at this time, so that's about it. Once I get Plex server running, then I can go ahead and set up my folder structure, which will probably just be one movie folder and everything will be inside that. And if we go to the file station, which is your file explorer or finder, we can see that there are no share folders available yet. We have to create them first. Before we do that, we need to actually format the drive array. Right now, there's nothing on there. There's no file structure. There's nothing to do. So let's go ahead and do that. We have a total of five unused drives, nothing set up yet. Under the hard drive SSD tab, we can see the health of everything, any logs, individual settings, etc., etc. This will somewhat depend on what drives you have installed. You can use smart or not. You can enable lifespan warnings, on the fly bad sector warnings, etc., etc. That's up to you. Hotspare is a very cool feature. What you can basically do is designate one or more of your slots as a hot spare. So for example, in this five bay unit, I could use four and then set one as a hot spare. And if one of those four in use fails, it will automatically use the hot spare and rebuild itself and then allow us to eject that failed drive. So there's absolutely no downtime. And then under SSD cache, if I had either one of the SSD slots populated, we could create the cache here. It's not going to do anything for movie streaming, but it would be very handy if you were using this for actual file access. Like if I was using this for photos or working files or databases or anything like that, I would definitely have at least one of those populated. So our first step is to create a storage pool. This is basically going to tell us to use the drives. I want the best performance possible. And here's where we can choose our RAID types. It'll go through explanations of what you can do. And for my application, I'm choosing RAID 5, which will basically create five layers of data, one for each drive, on each drive. So we will have four layers of data and one what's called parity stripe. The parity stripe is calculated from the other four drives. So what happens if you have one drive fail, it can calculate what's missing off the data on the other four drives. So you swap out the bad drive and it recreates itself on the fly with no downtime and no lost data. The only downside to RAID 5 is you can only tolerate one failed drive at a time. So if something really bad happens and you have two drives down, your SOL, the data is gone on the entire array. That is highly unlikely. It's been years since I had any drives fail. So we're going with five. Makes very good use of the physical drives. These are the drives we want to use. Yes, go ahead and erase those blank drives. And this is probably gonna take some time. Now we can actually format it or create a volume. This gives us a actual drive that the computer can see to use. Now right here, because they're brand new, it's going through its verification process. We can go ahead and use them now. In the meantime, we're gonna create the volume. We're gonna use the existing pool we just created, which is that one there, the only one on there. And yes, you could create multiples. Basically, the storage pool is the partition, for those of you familiar. And this is actually formatting the drive letter. So we're gonna give this a description and we're gonna call this movies. Well, you know what? I might want to put different stuff on there. So we're just going to call it NAS. Why not? 
And now we have our choice of actual format systems. This is the Synology default, which supports all the different protection and rebuilding formats. So that's what we're gonna do with. And now it's going through and actually doing the format. So it should be a pretty quick process. It's not actually writing any data. It's just creating the huge directory structure. And there we go, that just took about 10 seconds. Now it's just continuing with the verification process. It's letting us know that's going in the background up to almost half a percent done, yay. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna take multiple hours. While this is going, we can go ahead and install Plex. Yes, I agree to store. Yes, I acknowledge your privacy statement. Okay, so here is a bunch of third-party apps. Now, please note, these are not kept up to date. As with many Linux distributions, this stuff depends on the company itself updating what's available. Plex even says, do not use this for updating or installing. Download it directly from Plex. So just know that you can see things that you can install here, but you might wanna go grab them direct to get the latest versions. For example, right now, the version in here is over three behind what you can download directly from Plex but you can see there's lots of different things in here. You can use this NAS. For example, you can make a security system out of it. You can make a chat server out of it. You can make a virtual machine with a huge uh, hard drive. I mean, you can do tons and tons of different stuff with this particular NAS. So it's up to you. You can install full versions of Linux. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a computer. It's a full computer. You can make a web server out of it, whatever you wanna do. It's just a full computer, basically a stripped down laptop without a keyboard or display. Think of it that way. So now I'm gonna go over to Plex and download and install it directly. And just a quick note on the side here, if you click on installed, pretty much like any app store, you can see anything awaiting updates. We're gonna go ahead and update the search, which was installed in the firmware by default. And now we're done there. Now let's go grab Plex. So here on the Plex site, you can select what you're installing it on. So we want the Synology. We're going to choose the 64-bit Intel, which is what's installed in this particular unit. And it downloads the file, 100 megs. And then we go back to here. We're gonna do manual install. Browse to your file. And it should install. Unknown publisher, yes, please continue. Plex Media Server, latest version. We don't want to run after install. There's no data there yet. And now we have Plex. So this is like any streaming box, Roku, Nvidia Shield, Apple TV, etc. You can install stuff. Unlike some of them though, you can install from third-party sources. So if we click the little corner icon here, we can see everything that's installed on the NAS and you can right-click these and add to the desktop and it'll create a little shortcut if you want any of them up there for convenient access or right click them to remove the shortcut. That doesn't delete anything, it just removes these icons here. So I added these, I think these will be the ones that I at least somewhat frequently access. Storage Manager just brings up everything about the volumes and drives and it's still going through the verification. It's been a couple hours here. Uh, we've been up two and a half hours since I turned it on and we're at 37.56%, so it just gives you an idea. But like I said, you can keep doing stuff in the background. This isn't going to do much. So I'm doing a speed check, and I'm just transferring over some files here, some demo files for Atmos and DTSX, and we are maxing out the gigabit ethernet speed at about 113 megabytes a second. So that is working as expected. That is the most you're going to get out of no matter what drives you put in there you're gonna be limited by the network. So that's working well. Okay, so we've got our NAS working. We've got Plex installed. We need to be able to actually do this, to copy stuff to the NAS. And presumably you wanna do it very easily. So you pull up. So here's a tip. I literally just spent two hours, two hours going through hell here, trying to get everything to work and connect. Things were funky. I go through Google Wi-Fi, I have a three node home mesh network and I don't bridge my Frontier modem. It just works better that way. There are some smart home devices that don't reliably connect if I bridge it. 
but I wasn't able to connect from the NAS out to any device. I could copy files, but that's it. So here's what I had to do. I had to go into my Google Wi-Fi and give the NAS a static IP. I also had to forward ports 5000, 5001, and 80. Reboot everything, and now I've got a connection. Okay, so here is how we actually create a drive here in Windows so that we can copy files out. You go up here to Map Network Drive, give it a drive letter. Now, if you don't have a static IP, you follow the example down here. Two backslashes, whatever you named your server, mine is named NAS, slash whatever folder you want to share to. In my case, I put the IP address that I assigned to it, backslash my folder names. And then with this checked here, you will get a normal drive. So I did some test copies here. I'm getting the full gigabit ethernet, works out to about 113, 115 megabytes a second transfer speed. And everything is working hunky-dory. You can see my server name up here, NAS Media. What I did is I created a folder structure. If you click on file station here, I created a shared folder called movies and you just do that by create shared folder, give it a name. And then what we want to do is set permissions. You go down to properties, permission, and you need to give Plex read and write. And of course, administrator. And that will allow Plex to then use that folder structure. I don't need that, so I'm going to delete it. And then inside movies is where I'm going to drop all of my movie files. That will take days to transfer. It's about 15 minutes per um, 100 gigabytes. So you can figure how long it's going to take you, whatever you happen to be copying. So that's to get files actually physically on the NAS. Now we have to use them, and we do that with Plex. Now I'm going to create a new account because, again, it was giving me absolute fits trying to use my existing account. It wanted to connect to the old server, which was already deleted, and it just wouldn't sync up. It kept giving me a you cannot connect to the server error. Just would not work. So we're going to do a new account. <laughs> Look at that. It's dorking out again. Uh, let's see if I can just sign out. This was another test account I made. Yeah, we're going to do... Well, okay, this is the test account I made with nothing attached, so we'll try a sign-in. More. NAS. It's giving me an error here. Okay, there we go. So we're going to... It finally sees the server. Updates. Unclaimed. We want to claim the server. Okay, so now we have our server in place. Now you can configure Plex however you like to configure it. I'm going to do mine the way I like it. it. may not be exactly yours. All those settings are dependent on your particular location. But now the server is running and I can use it on my living room devices. To actually add the files that we're now in the middle of copying to the Plex server, we go down to Manage, Libraries. We're going to add the library and we're going to select movies. We're going to browse for the media folder. It's going to be under volume one media. And these are all single clicks, by the way, select movies and add. Now we can add that to library and now everything inside the movies shared folder will automatically be in the Plex library. Now, how often this updates itself is up to you. That is set in your Plex settings. I do it manually. So when I copy movies over, I just hit the refresh and let it go. You can have it automatically scan uh, as frequently as every 15 minutes if you want to. There's no real reason for that. It'll just keep the drive spinning up. But this is going to go through and add everything in that folder and it does take time. It took a couple minutes just for those few I copied in there real quick. And now we can see that it's pulled the thumbnails and the metadata, and those are good to go. Now I'm going to just uh, <laughs> get to copying and maybe 
next week, all my movies will be moved over. Hope this helps somebody. I'll put links down below for the NAS and the drives. If you want to put yourself together a version of it, feel free because it does work really nicely. See you later.